Okay, so let's talk about the uh, black red mid range matchup. This is a matchup that, oops. Okay, just making sure it's recording. This is a matchup that I usually hear people say it's like slightly unfavorable for Phoenix. My experience, I do fine against them, but though I don't know if it's a matchup that I want to choose to play against. I feel like it's it's probably one of your better matchups, but I could be wrong. I uh, I would need to uh, you know to more scientifically like play matchups and have a bigger sample size, basically. Anyway, um, I would say game one is usually um, easier to win than post board, as they don't have a lot of like if you cast pieces of the puzzle, it's like put it on the stack. It's like pretty hard for them to deal with, I think, because if they don't have graveyard hate, um, you can just like kill their threats, and then like they don't have a lot of card advantage. And then like as the game goes on, you just like are interacting with killing their permanents and having card advantage. Or I don't know. It's just like if you put this on the stack, and I guess uh, it, it's it's not obvious why that would be that good for you, but it's like. I'm trying to think of a concise way to explain why it's good. It's just like, yeah, I think they just like get completely drowned in cards. I was thinking if there's like a more scientific way to say that, if you put this on the stack, obviously like maybe you'll play the match and you'll like whiff on it or, or hit your removal, but like if you hit like a second piece in it and it crews or whatever, you're doing pretty well or a fork in a time walk. Um, So what changes post board is they're able to side in interaction for your graveyard. So you can't just like you know, cast pieces and freely win, or cast cruises easily, or even return arc lights as easily. Um, so, what I've found from playing the matchup post board is that the hardest games for you is when you don't have stuff to do with your mana. But when you have stuff to do with your mana, it can actually be quite, feel quite good for you. And to illustrate what that means, I'll bring up pieces of a puzzle again. Um, you know, the way they play the matchup. I guess that might be oversimplifying it, but since they have discard spells, sometimes they might discard um, the gas spells you have in your hand and and leave you without stuff to do, or they might play a graveyard, hate cards such as Hearse or Go Blank, and those cards will make it so that you can't cast Treasure Cruise or that you can't um, return Arclight Phoenix, and that will make it harder for you to spend your mana. Um... And yeah, so like, for example, if you keep a hand and, you know, they they discard a pieces of a puzzle and then you might not have that much stuff to do. And then you're just sitting there and they're casting, you know, Graveyard Trespassers and Fables and you have like Impulse and Axe. That can be pretty rough for you. Or like you play Ledger and they push it. Or you play Chart of Course and it's kind of spinning your wheels because if you discard a Phoenix, they could like Trespasser it. But um, yeah, so... But I found that if you have stuff to do with your mana, if you're able to, you know, put pieces of the puzzle in the stack, it can be um, pretty good for you. Or if you're able to, like, consider and, like, cast a treasure cruise. Um, I mean, they don't play a lot of card advantage in their deck. I'm not sure if that's that useful of a thing to say. I mean, one thing I'd say about pieces is that the more lands you haven't played, the better it gets. So, like, if you play pieces, like, on turn like five or six or seven, it could become a lot more threatening than early in the game. Not that it's not threatening early in the game, but like if you play it on turn five, for example, you could also ca cast a treasure cruise in the same turn and they don't have a chance to respond with um with a go blank to remove your graveyard. Um, it also means the extra mana, you'll have opportunities to dig for like and cast removal spells and maybe return arc light in the same turn. So it's like less deadly kind of in a way. It's also if it's like turn seven or turn eight or like I mean if you have like six seven eight lands in play you can like cast so many spells because you can like pieces into like pieces again or into crews and that's what I mean by it's more threatening and then you just think about the stuff they can do like later in the game they don't have that many you know powerful kind of things they can they can do like that like if they have eight lands in play think about the best turns they can have compared to so that's what I'm saying um yeah I'm not sure how like good of an example of that is so you can leave comments if that's kind of confusing but yeah so then I'll just go into how I sideboard in the matchup but I did find that was helpful to understand the matchup for me because sometimes I was losing a lot and sometimes I was winning a lot and I was like okay why when I'm winning why it's it was usually because I had stuff to do with my mana when I'm losing there were some games it was awkward I just you know had um 
too much interaction in my hand or whatever. So the way I like to sideboard, like these eight cards, and I like to cut my forks and my time walks and my thing in the ice, and my spell pierces, and then I'd probably cut like maybe a fiery impulse. And um, I can talk. I'll talk about why I sideboard like this and like why I cut the cards I cut because I know some people like spell pierce and stuff. So I like Brotherhood's End um, because they play a lot of uh, you know creatures that it hits like Blood Ties Harvester, Graveyard Trespasser, Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Um, what's the other one? Misery Shadow maybe if they don't have two mana up. So it can be decent at that, but also it's an answer to Hearse. Now I've seen Hearse be being less popular. So if you're, but even if my opponent didn't have Hearse, I would imagine I would slide it in. Um, just because the way their deck plays is they just play a lot of creatures. And, you know, I don't know. It's, it's like it's just like fine to hit like a Trespasser and like you can hit two cards. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, then Crackling Drake. Um, it might not look that impressive, but I find it's pretty good if, because since I leave in Shredder, so, um, it, uh, like, the drawing of cards pretty good with the Axe, because, like, it helps you have cards to discard with Axe, it helps you, like I said, pieces, if you have a lot of lands in play, it's pretty powerful, so, like, drawing the card helps you hit your land drops, because, um, so that, to get your pieces, it also, like, it's good with Ledger, Shredder, too, because, like, like, the raw card, um, you have a lot of ways to use it, and like since they play like Go Blank and Trespasser and Croxa, uh, it's like there's a lot of ways to use the card. Um, and sometimes if they don't have a way to trigger trigger uh, Revolt, it can be hard for them to push it. And yeah, and their removal like they're gonna want to use removal on your Phoenix sometimes. So what I noticed is at first I was setting out Shredder, but then it was kind of annoying if they would kill my Phoenix because then they could exile it with Trespasser. Um, so it's just like. I th even though they can push it, I think you have a decent amount of push targets, and um, it's just like a decent value card to cast. And I like to side in the crews because it's obviously pretty strong against them. The axe for the shield rids. So regarding spell pierce, a lot of people say they like it. The reason I don't play it is I basically I think the opportunity cost of holding up a mana is like pretty big. I think it's like kind of hard to leave up a mana to cast spell pierce. Um, the deck, most of the deck is sorceries. I mean, obviously you have some instants like opt-in consider, but like a lot of the cards the deck is playing, um, or it's like when you play ledger, a lot of times you might want to cast opt, you know, to get the connive, you have pieces, I guess it might not look like it, but the, the deck's like usually wants to tap out, um, on the main phase. Um, so basically, yeah, it's not like free and I felt like. If I could had infinite cards against black red, I don't. I feel like I would rather just like cast like card draw and threats and an interaction, and I wouldn't really want access to spell pierce. So maybe with the limited cards you have, it's spell pierce. But it's just like, I was like, yeah, I felt like when I played the matchup, I'm like, I don't really want this. Um, I felt like you don't need it. I'd say one thing about spell pierce, I tend to side it in less than most people. I would say I usually just like it when I really need it because Spell Pierce doesn't work that well with Arc Light Phoenix because this wants you to cast like a lot of spells on your main phase. Um, so obviously like counter spells in Arc Light Phoenix don't mesh that well together. And also like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So I'm kind of low on it, but it's fine to try it. I, most people tell me they leave it in. A lot of people tell me they like Fork because it's like a value card. It's like a card advantage card and the matchup's kind of grindy and they have a lot of ways to make you discard it with Trespasser and Croxa and maybe Liliana. I think it's fine to leave it in. The reason I cut it is I noticed when I was testing the matchup that I would be in positions where I would have iteration in my hand and I just couldn't cast it because I didn't have anything to Fork. And I'm like, this is kind of awkward. I don't feel like I really need this in the matchup. The, their game, like... The worst case scenario is when I don't have stuff to spend with my mana and this was accentuating that's those situations. It seems like it would be good because it gives you so much to do with your mana, but I found it's like not trivial to have a spell to fork. Um, and it would also be kind of awkward like if I had like a consider in my hand, I'm like, oh, I need to hold it for my fork. It was like kind of messing up my turns, but it's like fine if you like it. And yeah, I would say I could see that my plan has too much removal spells against them because... Um, it can be awkward when you're flooding on removal, basically. But 
so that's why I like trimming one. I mean, I'm sliding in like four removal spells, so I'm just trimming one, even though it's kind of decent against them. A lot of times they're just, um, I'd rather just have like threats to cast, like Ledger Shredder. Um, Ledger Shredder seems like it would be bad, but part of what I like is that you can always cast it, so it makes it harder for you to have dead mana, basically. And it can be like kind of better than you'd expect sometimes when like, if your opponent taps out for Harvester and then you play Shredder, now if they don't, if they want to play a three drop, they have to leave Shredder in play, you know, that kind of stuff. And with Charter Course, that can be threatening. I think that's most of what I have to say about the Black Red matchup. It's, uh, yeah, it's kind of a tight matchup. Um, I was thinking if there's anything I could say, like, if you have Phoenix and Charter Course, like, should you discard your Phoenix if they could trespass or it? I mean, it always depends on the context. I would say I discard my Phoenix a decent amount of time just because, like, otherwise you're discarding a real card, but, like, since Trespasser, you can discard it to wards. So if you have Fiery Impulse, maybe you'll discard another card. It really depends what's in your hand and, and unique to the situation. Um, and I tend, I cast Charter Course a lot on turn two because um, usually I'm trying to just uh, make it so I can cast my crews in pieces. And yeah, sometimes like with Go Blank, you'll be like, oh, should I hold my pieces because of Go Blank? Those will be those will be interesting situations. Um, but yeah, I guess it's uh, unique to the situation. That's most of the stuff. Oh yeah, I guess one thing you should know, I don't know if it's too irrelevant, but whatever, is when they flip Fable, it triggers Revolt on the last side. So like, um, if they have the key, if you like killed their token, then they have nothing in play. When the Fable flips, it turns back into a 2-2, so that's kind of annoying uh, and worth being aware of. Um, yeah, that's most of what I have to say, I guess. The way you try and beat Crocs is by like casting pieces. Like if it's like the cast Crocs on like turn five or six, sometimes she can be hard to interact with. But that's basically the plan for beating her is like hoping she's slow, basically. But yeah, stuff. So.